Um, okay, so it's in the middle of the middle of a discussion about a a chosid shaita. A uh, I guess the best way is is a uh, a stupid, very uh, an an ultra religious person who's very stupid. What what what's an example of a stupidity? Hey dummy. What exactly is that like? Chosid shaita, someone who's ultra religious but stupid. Tova Itza where there's a woman drowning in the river, but Amaran he doesn't want to save her. He says, Lav Ara I don't want to look at her when I save her. So therefore I'm not going to save her and I, and I will let her die. Hey Hidami Russia Aram, what's an example of a cunning, wicked person? Amr of Yechman Sigmar here gives a few suggestions of things that are wicked. Including sometimes, so, so these are these are like most of these are like legal legal workarounds, where technically speaking, you can absolve yourself from responsibility by doing one of these legal workarounds. Offering that suggestion or using it is is this category of a rush arm. The first one's illegal. It's where he talks to a judge before the uh, counterparty is present. Before the opposite side is present, he speaks to a judge. He's already convincing him, and the other the other party doesn't know what he said. Rebbevu Aimer, Rebbevu says, "This zeh nois and dinner la'ani lahashlem lahashlem asayimzus." Okay, this is a uh, this is sort of one of these uh, cruel cruel things that are technically legal. Basically, the halacha is as follows: If somebody does not have two hundred zuz worth of liquidable assets, assets that are not included in his income, his his housing. Etc. Mm-hmm. Two hundred assets. You figure is roughly speaking the the minimum amount it takes for one person to live live on for a year. I think when we learned Ksubis, we said it's uh, you know it's uh, 15, 15, you know maybe eight to twenty thousand dollars, twenty five thousand dollars, something somewhere around there. Very minimal income. So if somebody does not has less than twenty five thousand dollars, let's say worth of assets mm-hmm. of liquidable assets, uh, he's considered an oni. To the, the extent that this applies today. You talk to your local Orthodox rabbi. There, there is sort of an open question exactly how to calculate this and how relevant it is, especially given the fact that we live in sort of a very predictable society where one's future expenses are sort of known to him in advance. So maybe that even if he even if he does have the assets, he has predictable expenses that are way more than that. Mm-hmm. It's a separate discussion. How how relevant how it's used today. Regardless, the rule is as follows: the time we learned. Somebody who has a minimum amount of assets, he cannot accept charitable donations from typically what it was then, was like a chikopeo and maiserani. Maiserani is 10% given the third and the sixth year of the Shemitah cycle. So after you take off uh, Truma, Maiser, you take off Maiserani the third year and the sixth year. That goes to an Ani. Leket is so when you're when you're cutting the field with this is before the days of a combine, which makes almost all of this irre- irrelevant. But if you're slicing down wheat with it with a sickle, uh, so like it would be the pieces that fall out of the bundle. So you tie you tie the bundle together, you, you knock it down. But sometimes you miss a few pieces, or you or you uh, you um, use your sickle to knock down more pieces than were actually tied in the bundle. Uh, that's called like it. Shikha is where you forget a bundle. So you, what, what happens the way, again, a combine today sort of takes everything and puts it into one machine by one driver, and it's incredibly efficient. And it's why one of the reasons why we're so wealthy today and nobody works in agriculture anymore. But before the days of a combine, you would, you would, you would create bundles. So you tie together a bunch of bundles and a bunch of stalks, and then you chop down the stalks and you leave the bundle in the field. And you do this until the whole field, a field of, of standing wheat, is reduced now to a field of bundles of wheat that are tied together ready to be taken and then you take those bundles and you put them on a wagon or some other you know wheel wheeled machine and you wheel them away or you carry them away but let's say you forgot so you were going up and down the field and you were let's say that you had your field now was in rows of bundles and you walk down and you forgot one of the bundles while you were walking you skipped over one that one is called that that bundle is called shikha and it's you're not allowed to take it you have to leave it for the poor people Peya is a portion of the field recommended one in 50, but it could be more or less that you leave for the poor people. So all these basically are forms of charity. The point here is if you have if you have 
the minimum amount of assets you can take charity. Let's say he has 199 zuz. So he's one short of that minimum amount. You can give him, you can write him out a $10,000 check at once. You don't have to give him just one coin. Okay, he's allowed to take. So now what's the cruelty here? The guy sees the person collecting. He sees he's just enough money, but he's missing a little bit and he gives him that little bit. So he basically disqualifies him from accepting charity, even though he's still he's still really poor. Rabasi Amr Bechanan, Rabasi says the name of Bechanan, Zahamasi Eitz Alimkar Ben Chosim Watan. Okay. If anyone remembers some Ksubas, we learned about this. Basically, as follows Let's say a, a, when a man writes a Ksuba, he, he uh, commits to providing support for his daughters. His daughters are supported until they're, uh, until they're of the age to support themselves, not to his sons. Why is that? Because a woman, it's much more unpleasant for her to have to uh, collect money for herself. Whereas a man is able to do it. So therefore, the girls have priority over the boys. Now remember, in inheritance, the boys have priority, the girls get nothing. So sort of this is the way the rabbis balanced it out to make sure the girls have something to eat. They prioritize them in the case where there's not enough assets to both support and to split as an inheritance. The girls get first. Okay. Now, what happens if there... So let's say, that, let's say for example, there's a bunch of small children and you need, I don't know, $25,000 for the girls. And the whole inheritance is only $20,000. So the halacha is the girls get everything. However, because the girl's amount is not, is not fixed, it's not set. In other words, it, as needed, they sell off the assets. So when the girls need, you know, they, they give them a, a payments of a month at a time. They sell off the assets enough to pay them in a month, a month at a time. What happens if the, the sons went ahead and sold the assets before Besden had a chance to take them? The halacha is a sale is valid. And the reason for this is because it's considered an unfixed amount. Sort of, it's you know, one, one never really knows how much money is going to go for support because it's an ongoing payment. You know, if there's a debt, it's a fixed thousand dollars. So then they have no right to sell it because the, the, the property is has, there's a lien of the property by that debt. However, in terms of support, because it's it's a constant amount, therefore there's no lien. If there's no lien and the kid the, the sons go ahead and sell it, then they get to keep the money and the the daughters cannot have, have no recourse. If somebody provides a suggestion to the son to go ahead and sell the property before the daughters get a hand, get a hand on it, that's called a Russia arm, cunning <laughs> wicked man. Okay. The armor the armor of Asi uh, page position uh 21b uh we're six lines up from the bottom of the page. Um uh the armor first one the armor of Asi Amr Biakhan Rasi said the name of Biakhan, you say Mashem Mahro. If they sell a a uh, if they sell something in in the assets of their father, the sale is valid because there's no lien. Support does not put a lien on the property. Only fixed amounts like debt or stolen property, which would also be a fixed amount, that can produce a lien. Abaya Omar, Abaya gives another suggestion. This is somebody who gives it who gives advice to sell the assets like Rav Shimon Mingamliel. We're on a chaf al base four lines in the bottom of the page. Okay, so we'll explain what what was the halacha of Shmuel Gamli? The tiny we learned nix nixe loch the achrach leplaning. So he gives. Let's line up some people. So uh, uh, Steve Steve gave a gift to Eric, who was supposed to give a gift. At, who was supposed to take that gift, use it for some time, and then hand it up, hand it over to Jared. Of course. You, so uh, sure enough. Eric says, well, hold on. Right now, it's mine, so I'm going to do whatever I want. The halacha is, give the assets to the first person, Eric. And afterwards, he tells the first person, give it to the give it to Jared. The yard harishan, and Eric went down to the property, and he sold it, and he consumed the, the proceeds. There's nothing left. He, he turned it into steaks, and he ate it. Okay? Hasheni meitzimad al kuchas. Divir Rebbe. So according to the opinion of Rebbe, Jared would have a right to collect money from Eric for the property that Eric was supposed to hand over. However, Rav Shumil says, uh, Jared only has what Eric left over. Okay, so Abaya proposes that this is a wicked thing to do, and somebody who, who provides the suggestion is a cunning, wicked man. Rosh Rav Yosef Barcham Omer of Sheshis, 
Rav Yosef, Rav Yosef Bar Chama says the name of Rav Shesha, Zehemachriya Acherem Bar Chosef. Um, this is Rashi's explanation, which is, uh, this is somebody who gives other people advice about what to do in life, and he himself has a bunch of skeletons in the closet, or they're not really skeletons at this point, they're active. He has a sort of a separate personality that's uh, wicked. Rules leniently for others, but right. for himself is good. Right. Rules for thee, but not for me. I mean, for, I'm sorry, just the opposite. Yeah. So, Rav Zreik, Amr Rav Huna, Rav says the name of Rav Huna, Zeha Mekel Atzma, Somebody who's lenient for himself and stringent for other people. Ula Amar, Ula says, Zesha Kara Vashana Vlashimish Tamil Chaman. This is a person that has studied, uh, the, he has studied Torah, the written, the written law, Vashana, he learns Mishnayas. And Rashi, Rashi points out here that he's 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 ruling on halachic matters without having uh, without having interned by Tamid Chachamim. There's no internship. There's no fellowship experience. And the idea of the internship and the fellowship is exactly the same as it is in hematology or for any other ology, uh, which is that you, you gain an experience in knowing exactly how to balance a question. And that's sort of fineness. And if in the if, if this guy is ruling on halachic matters. Without having that experience, then he is he's a uh, w- wicked, cunning man. He thinks he has the right suggestion, but in reality, he does not. Okay, now we learn a couple more things about the same subject. Itmar. Somebody who's who's learned Torah, he studied Mishnah, and again, according to Rashi, he's he's asking questions, he's, he's ruling on halachic matters, but he does not have the experience of of a Talmud Chacham internship, so to speak. They call Shimush Tamid Chachamim. Rabbi Lozer Oimer, Rabbi Lozer says, he is a, he's a knave, you know, an, an, un, an unwise person. What, there are halachic implications for an Amaretz. An Amaretz typically means, an, you know, a regular, the regular peasantry. But the halachic implication is he's not reliable on true mismeisters. It's a very specific qualification. It doesn't just mean that you're a peasant as, an, as a derogatory insult. But it means that he cannot be trusted in matters of trumas and meisters. Shmuel Bar Nachmani Amar Harayza Bur. Shmuel Bar Nachmani says he's even worse than the peasantry. He's considered a boor. What, what did they translate that? What? Like a saucer. That's the next. Oh, that's, that's the next one. Uh, that's the next one. He's a boor. That's a mogush. Oh, he's a boor. He's a boor. Like okay. Yeah. That's the next one. A <laughs> boor. Okay. Um, worse than an Amaharis. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's about Both intellect and character. Yeah. Rabbiani Amar Rabbiani says, I raise a Kusi. He's, he has the status of a Kusi. This is sort of a borderline non Jew, which means that his bread is considered the bread of a non Jew, meaning it's not Pasis for all. And additionally, his wine is considered Stam Yenam now. It's not, it's not considered kosher wine. Rav Acha Bar Yaakov Amar Amar Rav Acha Rav Acha the son of the son of Yaakov says Harezem Mogush he is a Mogush a Mogush is a sorcerer. Amar Rav Nachman Bar Yitzchak Rav Nachman Bar Yitzchak says Mestavik Rav Acha Bar Yaakov Rav Acha Bar Yaakov's explanation that he's like a sorcerer makes the most sense. The Amri in Inchi because people say Rotten Megushev LaYoda My Amar this is sort of the uh, uh, what do they call that section of the newspaper with the um, horoscopes astrology. Astrology stuff in the, in the uh, oh, yeah. tarot, tarot card readings. They talk a lot and they don't know what they're talking about. So sort of this guy is like is like the tarot card reader. He, all he does is blabber away about all his sources, but he doesn't actually have the experience to know what he's talking about. Know what he's saying. Okay. Okay. He, he talks a lot, but he doesn't know what he's saying. What, what is an Amar? It's called Sha'ene Kaira Krish Mashachas Varvis. Somebody who does not say Krishma in the morning and the evening, with the properly with the brachas. Div Rameir, it's the opinion of Rameir. The Chachamim, the rabbis say, say, Kol She'enei Maniach Tefillin, somebody who does not put on Tefillin every day. He has the status of an Amaretz. And remember here, an Amaretz is a legal definition. Amaretz means this guy cannot be trusted for Trumas or Maestras. Benazi Amar, Benazi says, Kol She'enei Tzitzit Bigdai, even if he does not have Tzitzit on his clothing. Titus is sort of an optional mitzvah. You have an option of choosing not to wear a four-cornered begged, if a four-corner garment, if he makes that decision, he's still in the category of an Amar. It's even though technically speaking, there's nothing wrong with not wearing a four four-corner garment. And he'll be exempt from Titus. Rav Yenis and Yosef says, 
somebody who has sons but doesn't send them for Jewish education. Study, study, you know, the inheritance of, of the Torah that we have from our ancestors. Acherem Ayrim, another explanation is, typically Acherem is, is a reference to Rameir, over here it obviously is not, because Rameir is another author in the same Brisa. This is in general a question. Tais is addressed in a few places. A few places. Okay. Another example, somebody who's, not, who's an Amoritz is even somebody who's well learned, but he does not have the experience of a rabbinic fellowship. He's never been around the Torah scholar to get the experience of what it's like to rule on halachic matters. Zeo Amoritz, he's also considered Amoritz, and therefore he is unreliable for his Trumas and Maestris. Let's say he learns the Torah, but he does not learn Mishnayas. He doesn't, he doesn't understand the practical implications of it. Harez Abur, he's considered a Bur. Loikar of Loishana. Let's say he doesn't learn at all. All of Akas of Aimer. On him, the verse states, If Zerati is base Israel, that's base Yehuda, I will plant among the house of Israel and Yehuda, Zera Odom, if Zera the, 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 the children of men and the children of animals. In other words, a sort of a, a very low level of, of participation mm-hmm. in the Jewish community. Somebody who does not study Torah at all. What's that for Sufi from Rabbi? Just got curiosity. Yermia. Advice from Shlomo HaMelech, King Solomon. Yirei es Hashem b'ni. Fear God, my son. Umelech im shoinim al tesarov. And a king with the regular folks don't mix. What is that second reference? The king and the regular folk. Don't mix it. Amr v'yitzlok. Elu shoinim halachas. These are people that teach halachas. Hold on. But but do not have the experience of being mishamish tamid chachamim. They don't have experience of the, the immersive experience of a fellowship or an internship, something like that. <clears throat> so the Gemara, the Gemara says, Pshita, you know, what else? Shainim typically means to rule on rule on matters. What would the other explanation of Shainim be? Shall we to mute? I'm trying to mute. Okay. Um, so Gemara says, Pshita, ma'adotem shainim b'chet. Maybe the word shainim means to Shining could also mean to to repeat. Ukhtarafona, like this statement of Rafona, the Amar Rafona, the Kiman Shavar Adam Avera Bishanaba, Putrali. If somebody sins and then repeats his sin, it becomes as if it's permitted to him. Not that it's permitted, obviously, but he, he isn't so stringent anymore. So make Kamash Malan that the reference of Shainim here does not mean to repeat sin, it means to rule on halachic matters without the, the, the requisite experience. Tana, we learned, Hatanam Mevale Oilam. The people that know a lot of Mishnayas, they destroy the world. So the Mara says, Mevale Oilam, you mean to say that in how exactly they're destroying the world? Amravina, Ravina explains, Shemur and Halacha Mitoch Mishnasan. The risk here is if somebody learns a lot of Mishnayas and he's quote, you know, he's quoting all the Mishnayas, but he doesn't learn Gemara, which means he, he, knows the rule, he knows the laws, but he doesn't understand the reason behind it. So he rules in Halachic matters without the requisite understanding. And therefore, he destroys the world. Wait a second. Yeah. Tanya is yeah. Tanya We learned as well in a brayso. Amar of Yeshua Olam Loi. Is it the case that people that know a lot of Mishnayos is it the case that they destroy the world? It's the case that they build the world. Shneimer, as the verse states, Halichas Olam Loi. This is the pasuk we say every day at the end of davening. Where we talk about those that, that teach halachas every day, they learn Mishnayas. So what's what what's so destructive about learning Mishnayas? Again, there's nothing wrong with learning Mishnayas. It should be. It can't be only Mishnayas. El Shemur and Halacha Mitoch Mishnasim. They rule from Mishnayas, and the risk there is: first of all, they don't understand things. Second of all, they make comparisons that are incomparable. They compare things without understanding the underlying knowledge, and therefore it's really incomparable. And third of all, um, they do not know very often. We have in Mishnayas that one Mishnah is attributable to a single author, which the halacha does not follow. And therefore, they don't recognize when the Mishnah is, is not, does not follow the halacha, is not followed by the halacha. Okay, we learn about another uh, risk, another behavior not to, not to engage in, an Isha Prusha, a woman who is, who is uh, aesthetic. Aesthetic. She, she separates herself from the pl- ascetic, ascetic. She, she, uh, she removes herself from the pleasures of this world. Okay, the Gemara does not really explain this. The Gemara gives a few other examples. Tanar Baran, we learned. Besula Silonis, one second. 
tell exactly where they translate the word Salonis. Oh, uh, prom promiscuous. The Amona Shavivis, or a widow that uh, sort of hangs around the, uh, she, she socializes a tremendous amount. The Koton, and, and what seems to be, at least at this point of the Gemara, Koton means minor, somebody who has not reached the age of maturity, the adulterous. Mm -hmm. We'll get to it, it doesn't actually mean that. We'll get to it in a moment. Shalikolai Chadoshev, that his months haven't finished. Sort of odd. In other words, presumably this means a minor who's close to adulthood, but not, a, not an adult. We'll explain what this means. These people destroy the world. So the Gemara, uh, this question is a bit interesting. The Gemara sort of wants to understand what does a promiscuous uh, virgin mean? So the Gemara asks, the, Gemara, the way the Gemara frames that is as a question. Any. It's not the case. said, I've learned uh, to fear God, to fear sin from a virgin. The kibel schar and, and receiving reward from a widow. What was the story? What was the story where he learned to be fearful of sin from a virgin? There was this virgin that fell on the floor. And apparently she fell in a way that, that uh, her body was, was exposed. The Ka'amre, he heard a whisper of prayer. What was the prayer? Master of the universe. You've, you've, you've created a you know, garden of Aden, reward. You've created hell, punishment. Barasa Tzadikim, you've created righteous people that go to, you know, that go to Gan Eden, that get the reward of Barasa Hashem, and you created wicked people that get, that go to Gehenna, they get, they get punished, punished. Yehiratzim Ofanecha, it should be your will, Shalai Kashlu Bibine Adam, that nobody stumbles with, with, with my exposure. And again, this, this appears to have been an involuntary exposure. Okay, now obviously, obviously this is not a promiscuous virgin. One would think, right? Otherwise, she probably would have other intentions when she fell. When she fell. Okay, be that as it may, so the, the question isn't isn't a direct question. The Gemara is really trying to understand what exactly it means, what a besulat selonis means. Kibul schar me'almana, receiving a reward from a widow. Uh, what's an example of that? Dahi almana dahat dehavoi bekinishta b'shivusa. Hold on a second. Give me a second. Okay, it, it appears that actually this it appears the question was not never on Basula. The question is the second the second part. An almana, an almana who socializes is, is is destroys the world. And, and this next story seems to be an almana who at least partially socialized to the extent that you could call it socialization. Okay. There was a widow that had a synagogue in her in her community, Shul. She would come to shul every day in the, the shul of Rabbi Yechanan, which apparently was at a much greater distance. And she'd pray there. Amr Allah, so he said to her, Don't you have a shul in your neighborhood? Amr Allah, so she responded, Rabbi, Do I not have the additional um, reward for walking to shul? And it's a longer walk to your shul, which means there's more reward to walk to the shul that's further out. Okay, so this appears to be at least some level where she's socializing. She's, she's taking long walks and she's going to shul every day. And the Gemara wants to know, so what exactly is a, is a, a widow that socializes? What exactly is that a reference to? The Gemara says, Ki Kamar, who are we talking about? Yechen, Yechni Bas Retivi. We're talking about a wicked, wicked widow whose name was Yechni Bas Retivi, the daughter of Retivi. What exactly was the story of Yechni Bas Retivi? So Rashi explains, uh, she apparently was a sorcerer. Now, I'm not exactly familiar with sorcery, so you'll have to take this, take this from Rashi, where basically she would, she was a, uh, she was a doula. She'd help. She was a midwife. She'd help women give birth. And what she would do is, she, when she, when she went to, when she saw a woman in, in uh, labor, she'd do some sorcery, and somehow, and she'd, she'd lock some spirits into a jar, and that would make it impossible for a woman to give birth. And then the woman would get into a, a severe uh, situation where her labor wasn't progressing and she was in tremendous amount of pain and she begged the midwife, this Yechni, to pray for her, at which point she'd go into the other room, she'd release the spirits from the jar she'd make her, and, and, then, and then the baby would be born. So it seemed as if her prayers were always answered. One time there, there was a story where she had an assistant and the assistant was in the other room by mistake and he, she heard the, the spirits in the jar so she opened the jar, the spirits came out and the, and the mother had a baby the next moment. And they recognized that Yechon Basra TV was a sorcerer, fraudster. 
and she was she was pretending to be this you know tremendous religious uh, prayer scholar, and actually she was just uh, wick, a wicked a wicked widow. Okay, my cotton shall I call a chadashav? What's an example of a cotton? A what seems to be a minor that hasn't finished his months, meaning he's just short of adulthood. What exactly does that mean? Sigmar says, doesn't it actually mean a minor? What it means is, here we explain, we're talking about a scholar who's studying, he's, he's studying in, in, in school, and he, he despises his leaders. See, he's called a cut, and he's called a minor because he hasn't yet reached maturity of, of scholarship. And yet he despises his, uh, he despises, he despises those that are teaching him. It's a scholar that has not reached the level where he can rule on halachic matters, umayra, and yet he, he continues to rule. says the name of name of This the verse states, because many corpses he he's uh, he, he's he's killed. He's he's uh, he, he he's created many corpses. Okay. We'll translate that in a moment, what that second part of the verse means. He's created many corpses. This is a scholar who has not reached the, the level of scholarship to rule on halachic matters, and he does so anyway, regardless. He, he, he results in many fatalities. The word otzim can mean a few different things. In, in here, here in context, Rashi explains that otzim means to withhold. So in this case, because of with something withheld, kol haruga, there are many people that are killed. What exactly is being withheld here? It's the opposite. It's a scholar who is able to rule on halachic matters, and he does not. Because he's withholding his ability to rule on halachic matters, he's also responsible for killing people. Okay, the ad kama. What's an appropriate age where one can sort of figure out if he's if he's if if he's ready to rule? It's about 40 years old. Igmar asks any of a What about the fact that Rabba, Rabba ruled in halachic matters? And what's the problem with that? Rabba only lived 40 years. How do we know that? Because Rabba and Abai were the grandchildren of Eliakim, the Gemara Megillah. And therefore, the grandchildren of Eliakim do not live more than 40 years. Okay, maybe if they study Torah, they do. Ayn Sham, you can see over there in the Gemara Shana what the solution is for them. Regardless, but evidently, Rabba ruled before he was 40 years old. The Gemara says Bishavin, where Rabbah was on a level of greatness that was sort of equal to the local rabbi, and therefore he was he was able to rule in halachic matters. To continue with uh, sort of nefarious behavior, Makis Prushim. Uh, these are the the blows suffered by a parish, by an ascetic, somebody who again is is removing himself from the pleasures of this world. Panarabodam. The rabbis taught Shiva Prushinhain. There are seven ascetics. All of these are bad things. We'll, we'll translate each of them in, in a moment. Let's just see them. Prush Shechmi, somebody who's a, who's a parish, uh, an ascetic for his shoulders. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. For, for like, like the person of Shechem, we'll explain. Prush Nikfi, somebody bangs himself. Prush, uh, Prush Kizoi, he, he, he lets blood. Parish Miduchya, we'll explain what that means. He, he's bent over like a, like a, like a, um, uh, like a mill. Somebody who says, what, what do I need to do? And I'll do it. What's wrong with that? We'll see. He's somebody who separates from the enjoyment of this world out of love for HaKadosh Baruch Hu, lest he sin. See what's wrong with that. Somebody who, who separates himself from this world because he's afraid to get punished by too much indulgence, indulgence in, in you know, worldly pleasures. Okay, let's explain them. What does that mean? Is that Isa Ma'isa this is somebody who does the actions of Shechem. What did Shechem do? He raped Dina. He, well, first he seduced her, but but the the actual the actual act was an act of rape. Oh, I'm sorry. 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 That's correct. That's what Rashi points out. Rashi points out also he circumcised himself for ul ulterior motives. He was not. He did not. Do, his actions were not l'shem shemayim for the sake of God. Porsche Nikvei. Somebody who who gets who's a an ascetic because he gets banged up. So this is a guy who sort of drags his feet out of perceived humility, and he and because he drags his feet, he often bumps his feet into rocks. Parish kizoi, somebody who who is a parish because of bloodletting. This is somebody who who makes believe he doesn't look at women. 
and therefore he's his head sometimes bangs against the wall and he he get you know he has wounds blood blood comes out parish me somebody uh somebody who is a parish like a like a like a uh a, a, a mill like bent like a what was that? Then like a pestle, like pestle, like pestle. Was, pestle. Yeah. I'm a rabbi. Shiloh, the mishapek, he miduchia. He's bent over. He's looking at the ground, like the bent over, like the like the handle of a pestle. He's bent over. So his head sort of looks thicker on top. On top. Parish machevasi vesera. Somebody who's who's in ascetic because he says, "What else do I need to do?" And I'll do it. So the Mars is how malusihi. That isn't that a good thing? He looks at what he's obligated, his responsibilities, and he fulfills his responsibilities. He makes it seem as if he's done everything already. It's just like, I've done everything, now what else should I do? Okay. Parish uh, me'ava, somebody who's a parish out of love or out of fear. Parish me'ira. Amr le'abaya, Amr le'abaya v'rava. Abaya v'rava says, says, tell the author, Latano, le'tisni, parish me'ava, parish me'ira. Remove those two from the b'risis, from the b'risis, because there's nothing wrong with that. The Amr of Yehuda, Amr Rav, Yehuda says in him, "Rav, lo elam yasik adam b'Torah u'mitzvus afilu shaloy l'shma." One should engage in Torah study even for the wrong reasons. Shemitah shaloy l'shma bol l'shma, because if you do it for the wrong reasons, eventually you'll do it for the right reasons. And therefore, if a person is doing it out of his love of reward or his fear of punishment, which is not love of God or fear of God, mm-hmm. these are lesser levels, but there's still something significant, and one should still behave that way. There's nothing wrong with that. Okay, Amr of Nachman. Omar of Nachmer Yitzchak, Omar of Nachmer Yitzchak says, the metamro, metamro, that that's hidden is hidden, the megalia, megalia, and that that's revealed is revealed. Be'dina rabo l'spara mehani d'chofnu gundi. One second. Yeah. Um, basically, the, the hidden, the, what's hidden is, is hidden from, from men, and what's revealed men know about. But God, God in heaven knows exactly what's going on. And therefore, he will, he will d- exact punishment from those that wear a cloak of righteousness, but underneath it, they behave in immoral ways. I'll get to a very important Gemara over here. Amr le'yane mak So finish with this Gemara. Basically, there was a king, his name is Yane Habelach. One of the famous things he did, one of his more notorious actions, was to wipe out many, many, kill many Torah scholars. Now, when he died, his wife was sort of fearful. What's going to happen? Are they going to take revenge from me or not? This is very simple. He says, the Torah scholars you can trust are not going to take revenge because you, you weren't the one who killed them. I was the one who killed them. So you have no, you don't have to, you have no fear from these people. They're not going to take revenge on somebody who didn't, who didn't sin to them. What about the people that aren't scholars, the, the sort of the, the common folk? They're very happy to kill the scholars. So they won't be too happy. They won't be displeased with you either. So who should you be afraid of? Don't be scared of scholars. And don't be scared from those that aren't scholars because those are happy. They're happy I killed all the scholars. From the chameleons, the people that change color. They, they, make, them so, they make people think that they're like scholars. They behave like Zimri. In other words, they're highly promiscuous. But they demand from, like, like Pinchas. Pinchas, remember, was the one who killed Zimri. Because Pinchas had felt a, a religious zealotry, and he killed Pinchas, and he killed Zimri, and these people, because they pretend to be to be to be very, uh, uh, they pretend to be very uh, zealously religious, so therefore they demand reward like Pinchas. So these are the people you have to be afraid of. Continue the mission tomorrow. Great day.